they do happen, they happen nearly every year. And of course, if an F5 comes down your street, if you're not in a safe room or a basement or a cellar, you're, you're probably going to be history. The first line of defense against severe weather is the National Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. But unfortunately, even these scientists can't predict exactly where and when a tornado or even a thunderstorm will strike. We don't have a very good picture of the potential of thunderstorm activity and exactly where it might be able to develop. We all wish that we could uh, pinpoint the exact location where severe weather will strike and tell people what time it's going to strike. But the science hasn't reached that point yet. The storm center monitors the atmosphere across the entire continent and then uses computer programs to try to predict where the most dangerous storms will develop. If general conditions look strong for tornadoes, the storm center issues a tornado watch often covering tens of thousands of square miles. Only after radar suggests a tornado is forming does an official tornado warning go out. When we issue the warning, the warning is supposed to mean that that tornado has been detected. It is there. We want to be able to take it to that next step where we can say, We've got this really bad storm. Conditions where that storm is headed are ripe for a tornado to develop. Where we're at right now, when you've detected it, it's occurring. Official tornado warnings often come too late. On average, only 12 minutes before a twister strikes. And frequently, they're false alarms. One man believes we can do better. My dream is to be able to detect tornadoes down at very fine scales, to anticipate tornadoes a half an hour before they occur. We're talking about a storm forming to produce a tornado over a county or a city. It's a whole different ballgame. Kelvin Drogemeyer is a meteorologist who wants to overhaul our current system of detecting tornadoes. We need to see closer down to the ground. That's where the weather really happens. I mean, the storms up in the atmosphere, they're the ones that eventually cause the weather, but the stuff that's actually affecting society happens down near the ground where we don't really observe things very well. Today's system relies in part on a network of Doppler radar. Doppler can sense the movement of air and moisture in remarkable detail. Used as long-range radar, Doppler dishes are spaced 100 miles apart or more. Gazing out over the horizon, they can't see what's happening close to the ground where tornadoes form. There, there's a limit to tornado prediction, and I believe we have reached that limit right now. With all the available information that we have, radars are only put at certain locations. They're not everywhere. Radars that, uh, that we have can scan out 100 miles, but at 100 miles, they're only scanning the top part of the storm. And so they're not seeing down low. Kelvin Drogemeyer dreams of a world filled with Doppler dishes, hung on cell phone towers, and all kinds of buildings just 20 miles apart. This Doppler-rich world could paint a much more detailed picture of the weather maybe even catch tornadoes in the act of forming. We want to put a few of these radars out there to make sure that if a tornado is beginning to form, we know absolutely for certain that it's going to happen, and we can tell you that 30 minutes ahead of time, whether it's a weak tornado, a strong tornado, whether it's in December or, or March or, or May. Kelvin is now wiring central Oklahoma with an experimental network of small radars, confident that his plan will someday revolutionize the forecasting of tornadoes, including super twisters. But others aren't so sure. You might be able to predict that a storm may or may not form. Uh, you may predict that some storms may be more likely to produce strong tornadoes than others. But we may never be able to predict that a given storm in a given location will go on to produce a tornado. 
years. Howie Bluestein's skepticism comes from over 25 years chasing down storms in the twister-prone region of the Central Plains, known as Tornado Alley. When he started out, Howie's operation was certainly low-tech. Yeah, go west. There were no laptop computers, and then we can drop south. No global positioning system. Towering queue and small CVs building up under the anvil. No cell phone. I'm a little bit worried about something happening uh, right back uh, just south of Norman. Over time, the Storm Chaser's arsenal has expanded. Howie was the first to put a radar dish on the back of a truck and capture crucial data of tornadoes in action. But even with today's tools, storm chasers like Howie consider themselves lucky if they intercept one or two good tornadoes each year. Because the thunderstorms that spawn them are extremely complex creatures. Whether a thunderstorm forms in, in one county or the next county could depend upon differences in wind that you can barely detect with instruments or changes in temperature or humidity that are barely detectable. And Howie knows just how far we are from understanding the true nature of tornadoes. We still haven't solved the problem yet. We still haven't figured out exactly why tornadoes form. For all their long years of study, storm chasers are forced to admit that the exact chain of events that turns a thunderstorm into a tornado is still a mystery. We know that supercell thunderstorms make tornadoes. But we also know that most of them don't. Josh Werman is one of Howie's colleagues and a fellow storm chaser. Only about 20 or 25 percent of supercell thunderstorms produce tornadoes. And only perhaps 1 to 5 percent of those produce what we call significant tornadoes, the large ones, long track, the ones that do 90 or 95 percent of the damage and fatalities. Okay, down two. Stop here near the hill and start scanning. I feel like we're in a twister movie. Josh has witnessed some of the most powerful super twisters of recent years, including the May 3rd, 1999 storm that hit Moore, Oklahoma, where he recorded the fastest winds ever measured, just over 300 miles per hour. When the massive super twister first set down, it was in a field about 40 miles from Moore. TV forecaster Gary England had a full hour to warn his audience. Do not try to ride this storm out in your home unless you are trapped. Get in the center part of your house, a closet or bathroom, cover it with pillows and blankets. Lots of pillows, lots of blankets. Get in the bathtub, get, put the kids in the bathtub, get in on top of the kids. This is absolutely the only thing going to get to as we speak. From Channel 9's command center, Gary and his viewers could see exactly what was coming. Right now, it may turn a little bit to the north of Norman. If it maintains itself, you folks in North Chick Chick. May 3rd, there was continuous coverage. They had helicopters up in the air filming the tornado so people could watch the TV, see exactly where the tornado was. They had radar with fantastic capability showing the path that this thing was going to take. So people knew what was coming. <laughs> We got a follow on the ground right now, right inside. Tornado on the ground. Debris cloud, debris cloud. There it is. Multiple. May 3rd, you know, we had nearly 70 tornadoes in our viewing area here in Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, a lot of people killed, you know, what, 8,000 structures destroyed. People pay attention now. The May 3rd Super Twister was the most powerful on record. And yet, after it finally fizzled out, Josh Werman and his team discovered yet another super twister roaring over open country. During the May 3rd outbreak, there were at least 50 other tornadoes. One of those was over four times as large as the one that went through the metropolitan area of Oklahoma City. Had that tornado gone through Oklahoma City, it would have caused a damage swath four times as wide, probably a mile wide or more, destroying many times more structures than were actually destroyed. The May 3rd, 99 event is a major, major event to the people in Oklahoma, and especially the people in Oklahoma City. But how many people outside that area realize what happened there, realize the carnage that took place? It's not just powerful winds that make super twisters so deadly. Once they form, they often keep on churning, staying 